What are we going to do now that Jesus' ministry is getting more bold? That's what we're going to talk about in Matthew 14. All right. So we heard the stories of the parable. Jesus started talking in these complex stories so that one, we can remember it better. I mean, parables are easy to remember. And not only that, they reach all sorts of people. When you're talking about farmers, fishermen, everyone understood this kind of story. He was talking in the language of the people. So now he went to Nazareth and was rejected by people. And so we start off chapter 14, seeing a different part of the story. Herod the Tetrarch, which means the fourth, meaning he was a sub leader. He wasn't a king. He was below that, but he was ruling this area. And he heard about Jesus and what Jesus was doing. And this is what got me to be a little bit interested about it. He had John the Baptist in prison and got confused and said, oh, I think that he has been raised, John the Baptist, from the dead. This Herod's son went and stole his brother Philip's wife. And Philip's daughter, Salome, came along with the mother. And John was making a big stink about this. He was telling Herod the Tetrarch the truth. This does not stand. You cannot steal your brother's wife. This is not a marriage. You cannot be married to your brother's wife. And of course, (laughs) that didn't make Herod happy because, again, he threw him in jail. But it also didn't make Herodias, the wife, happy either. Because, like, she did this for whatever reason she did it. I don't, we don't know those reasons, but she picked this life. And in the midst of John yelling at Herod, he's yelling at her too. So the daughter, Salome, dances for Herod. Now, what I see from the commentaries is dancing at that point in time was a seductive act. You did this to attract a man. You, yuck. But the mother told Salome, the daughter, you're going to be asked if you want a reward for your amazing dancing. Ask for the head of John the Baptist. From what I understand, when you're in Sunday school, this gives you an excellent chance to create a paper mache head of John the Baptist. So the king is like, sure, I can do that. And it says here then the king was sorry, but because he swore an oath, he decided to do it. (laughs) Oh, boy. And so he went, beheaded John in prison, probably not him, but his people, and brought the head on a platter. Then his disciples went and took the body and buried it. This is a pretty grisly thing and a pretty terrible thing that Herod is doing. What was interesting to me about this entire story is Herod the Great was a very detailed person. When he heard the Messiah was going to be born, he got his scribes together. People were looking at documentation, trying to figure out where and when this was going to be. But Herod the Tetrarch, he doesn't seem that concerned. He's blurry and fuzzy about who John is compared to Jesus and if they're the same people and they're creating miracles. This doesn't strike me as a man of detail. We already see a not very good king in place right now. And history will remember him for just what a terrible king he was. So Jesus, we hear upon hearing this, goes out into, a, it says, a desolate place. But the crowd, as always, is following him. He has compassion on them. And one of the commentaries said, this compassion, it doesn't do the word justice. It's like your heart is like drenched in sorrow. Like you have compassion to the level where it affects you physically. This is a bigger word than I think. And I had compassion on him. You know, it's, it's a much, it's a much more meaningful word. So he starts healing them and healing their sick. And the disciples say, hey, send these people out so they can go buy food. It's getting late. They're pretty hungry. We're pretty hungry. And they only had five loaves and two fishes, which was some boy's lunch. So Jesus says to bring these items to him. He breaks the bread and he makes the meal enough as a miracle to feed 5,000 men. That means that there were also women, many children also there. Don't I think, take offense at the fact that they were counting men. It was the system where they counted people. But you can imagine this could be 15,000, 20,000 people. And he fed the crowds. He had, again, compassion for them. People need to eat. And they wanted to be near Jesus. So the disciples get back in the boat 
and Jesus goes to the mountain to pray. While Jesus is out there praying, the boat is getting walloped on the Sea of Galilee. Again, a very susceptible lake to storms. But we also can't take away that supernatural aspect that there's a message in here from Jesus. So Jesus starts walking out towards the boat in the middle of the water. And everyone's freaked out. They think they're seeing a ghost. They're scared. Now they were first scared about the waves, and now they're scared because of Jesus. But when they see that it's Jesus, Jesus says, you know, this is you. Command me to go walk out to you. Is this Peter being bold? Is this Peter being impetuous? Is this Peter testing what he's seeing before his eyes? Like, if you're really Jesus, you can make me walk on water. Peter gets out of the boat, starts to walk. He starts to look and see all the waves going around him. And then he begins afraid, starts to drown begs Jesus to save him. Jesus raises his hand out in the water and grabs him and brings him back into the boat. And they both are in the boat. I don't know. I was in a weird mood, you know, so I was writing this podcast and I started rewatching The Chosen again. So I sort of culture, the mood of the area. I think that show gets it pretty right. It feels like a lot of study was done about what it was like in these towns at these times. And they get to the part of this scene And Peter starts to drown. And all of a sudden, you just see this hand coming down in the water to save Peter. I got weepy. I'm not a very weepy person, but this got me all choked up. Because doesn't it feel like at that moment when we're drowning, for whatever reason we feel like we're drowning, we see Jesus' hand right there coming in to reach us, grab us, and pull us back into the boat. There's also a fantastic book that someday I'll do on the podcast, Small Steps with God, that is by John Ortberg called, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. What happened there? People feel, for the most part, and it's pretty obvious, that Peter was in contact with Jesus. I mean, this was a strong faith, a strong connection. And the metaphor a lot of people use is as soon as he let fear, the waves, the surrounding environment get to him. He became separated from his power source and started to sink. He was doing it because not of him, but because of Jesus. And he pulls away out of fear, and and then he can't do it anymore. Some side information is that this is what was called the fourth watch. This was a Roman terminology for between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., but most commentaries felt this was somewhere near dawn. The other really interesting thing is when they saw Jesus out there and they were terrified, they cried out and Jesus said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. That it is I refers back to the phrase, I am what I am, Yahweh, I am the God of the Old Testament. When Moses asked for the name of God, he was told, I am. And it refers back to that same word. It's the same phrase that's used. This is him identifying as Yahweh. The other interesting part is he told Peter, come, he can use very simple words to instruct people to do the right thing. And then he says to Peter immediately, O ye of little faith, in the old, I think in King James, but in ESV, which I read from, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you let the things of the world, the waves and the wind, interfere in our relationship between us? They worshipped him right away, (laughs) were amazed, and said, he is truly the Son of God. There's no doubt in their mind anymore. This is the Messiah. So they go to Gennesaret, which is a town, I think that it was five miles southwest of Capernaum, and Jesus healed even more people. It said that people were touching his clothing. I think we learned when the woman who had the bleeding problem touched his cloak, it was obvious that it's not the cloak, the object that was healing people, but it was Jesus because of faith healing people. So even though it talks about them touching his cloak, I just think it's an image of people in desperation grabbing anything they can to connect with Jesus. And that is the end of chapter 14. Again, this is all the same time period we have placed. This is taking place in the Lonely Mountain area. We see him around the Sea of Galilee. What does this say about God? 
is that he has that deep, wrenching compassion for us. And even when he is at that moment of sadness, he still cares for us. He wants to heal us and he wants to relate and feed us. There's really not many literary features in here. This is a pretty straightforward reporting of this chapter. What does it say about God? Despite our doubts, he is always there to reach out his hand and save us. And we will know we failed in that moment, but he is always there to save us. And what does it say about God's plan? Is despite our doubt and despite our lack of faith and our human needs of food and (laughs) shelter and, and everything that Jesus has to offer, he still has compassion for us and cares for where we're at. I'm going to meditate this week on the getting out of the boat. I don't know. That story always struck me. I would never do it. I would never get out of that boat. What does it say about Peter that he did? Does it say that he was bold? Does it say that he was impetuous? Because we know that Peter can be both those things. Or does it say, I lack something. I have doubt because I will never get out of that boat. I'm going to have to think about that one this week. My prayer for this week is to gain that kind of faith that would walk out of the boat and take the hand of Jesus. But I know that when I see the world crushing in around me and I start to sink, Jesus will be there to grab my hand. Now I see I'm getting all weepy again. And the part that I want to share is that, that when we feel we are drowning, either literally or figuratively, We should think about Jesus' hand coming down and grabbing us. He is always there. Whatever event it is turns out the way we would hope it would, or it doesn't. That doesn't mean that Jesus' compassion, care, and saving us isn't there. What we imagine the end of each of those stories turning out may not be, but in the end, Jesus is there to give us his hand and bring us close to him and back into the boat. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. With this being chapter 14, that means we're halfway through Matthew. Matthew has 28 chapters. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. Check out the website and let me know if there's other tools or things that I could provide that would make this Bible study easier. I really appreciate you listening. Please tell a friend. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.